Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I am a professor and an assistant dean for nutrition and dietetics in the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition. Um, flipping to the second one, Palash. I, my work is primarily global. Um, much of my research is community engaged, also focusing on nutrition, community public health nutrition. But I thought I would talk about who are we because in most, for most of my work, we are an interdisciplinary team focused on community research. And most of the researchers um, have been from the College of Pharmacy and Nutrition, the College of Agriculture and Bioresources, Soil Science, Plant Soils, and Agriculture Economics, and then National Research Council, Agriculture and Agriculture Canada, and of course, the Faculty of Social Work in Regina. We like to think of ourselves as collaborative, that most of the work that we do are based on working with community groups. So community partners, government policy holders, and this is how we have worked through the years. Next one. Keep flipping. What methods and tools are we using? Um, one of the first things that we do in most community is to do an environmental scan, which is focused on qualitative, quantitative research to, to, see, to seek out what the, the needs of the community are. And by doing so, then we work to address some of those needs, work with them to address the needs. Uh, relationship building is one of the most important aspect of community engaged research. And this we have done through community forums, to farmers, to consumers, and also to households. And then we've held what we call dialogue events, uh, much like today workshops then with key stakeholders, some who are cultural advocates, local policymakers, in order to gain a, an understanding of what the community needs and priorities are. And then building on those then, we build the research team. And so we may begin as an N of one, but more than likely end up as an N of 20, because as we understand the community needs, then we work to um, ask and seek out other researchers, scientists who can join us to address those needs. Then beyond that, the needs assessment, we have done pilot studies. And again, these are just to help us to select what we consider are the most promising interventions that not only can be scaled up in that community, but can be um, scaled up elsewhere. Can you flip for me the next one? And so what this one is um, an example of one that we've done, and I thought we've done a number of them, but I thought I'd talk a little bit about the Ethiopia study since that exemplifies a lot of what we do in community engaged research, which brings social science, natural science, agriculture, everyone together. And the first one you notice from 1997 to, to, to 2018 was really a project that started with um, the College of Agriculture, two science scientists, soil scientists getting together and saying the soils in Ethiopia are poor, what can we do to address that? And I heard Leon talking a lot about soil nutrient today. And this is where the soil scientists started and worked in capacity building, not just at the institutional level, but for graduate students and so forth. And then 2008, College of Ag um, Pharmacy and Nutrition came along. And this is where we begin to ask the questions now that we've built the soil, what do we need to do next to feed people to address issues of food, food insecurity? And the question was, why is it that most people don't eat pulse in Ethiopia? And so 
Together as a team, we developed the Pulse Strategy um, funded by Global Affairs Canada. And so we worked with Hawassa University and this is called linking agriculture and nutrition along the bio train. And here's where we utilize what we call the shoulder season water for chickpeas production. Ethiopia is landlocked. Um, most of the soil, acid soil. And so we had to look for ways to address food security. And one way was, well, pulse, it's cheap. It's one way that we could grow it after they've grown their major product like wheat or maize. And so with the College of Agriculture on both sides of the, of the continent, they looked at different agronomic practices, they looked at ways then through for, um, to improve the seeds and develop seed de delivery systems for home use, for domestic and also for import. And then on the nutrition agri-foods um, processing, we looked at improving nutrient bioavailability and di diversity. We did all this by using a gender empowerment strategy and then as we were kind of winding that down, Leon came along and says, great, we would like to help you work on the acid soil component. And so with Leon since 2018, we have been looking at that soil nutrient interaction, looking at the impact of um, with acid soil. And so that's a project that's ongoing. We have done some work. We are currently evaluating that the nutrient impact. And from that, we will continue to look at other, other opportunities for wider application. Hey, Carol, we have to just wrap up there. That's it. That's it. I was gonna tell you about the next one, but We've just we're about eight minutes along. I just and we've got a we've got a big speaker. All right, I'll so, stop. The rest you can read. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Carol. Do you want to just put up your big question to the group? Well, I think the one was the relevance of community and engaged discussions as we look at understanding um, food nutrient interaction and so forth, but. I see as I listened this morning, some of that was being discussed, so we'll move along. It's, no, I think that's a great place to end, Carol. That's an important piece. Thank you very much. All right, so as you close that off, Palash, then Benani Roy, Roy is gonna be our next speaker. Hello, and can I share my screen? Am I allowed? Yeah, yeah. Benani, go Please. ahead, you can. Okay, I'm trying. Okay, do you see my screen? Yep, looks good. Where you go? Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Banani Roy. I'm the assistant professor at the Department of Computer Science. And I joined in this position last year in April. So I did my PhD from Queen's University, Canada in the area of uh, handling disconnection in synchronous group wire. I did my MSc from RWTS Aachen University, Germany. And now I'm the director of interactive software engineering lab. It's a very newly established lab and where we focus on developing tools, techniques, methodologies, frameworks, and APIs for the developers using which uh, they can build usable software systems. I have been actively involved with uh, two CFRA projects, PTRC and GWF. My research interests uh, are on engineering, scientific workflow management systems and big data analytics. So what I have done so far, our research studies show that existing scientific workflow management systems are not user-friendly for the scientists and they struggle a lot to make use of these 
systems. Realizing the shortcoming, we designed and developed collaborative, reliable, and ease of use scientific workflow management system that basically allows scientists to model and execute a, a scientific um, experiment easily with the workflow that involves uh, various analytic tools and data set. So at the right hand side, you can see an example workflow in plan phenotyping where um, different uh, software tools are being connected with the uh, image data to extract uh, useful information from the uh, field images like uh, nutrient nutrition deficiency, flower count, leaf size, and so on. And um, uh, scientific analysis is uh, multidisciplinary in research. So in our developed systems, uh, we allow scientists to compose workflows and analyze out outputs collaboratively in real time. And uh, using the system, the scientists can handle uh, and reuse process data efficiently and interactively. And they can easily integrate um, new analytic tools and they can um, do reliable data analysis with governance support. So in my research, uh, I have been basically focusing on different research questions, including how to support large scale data analysis, how to support effective and adaptive real-time collaboration, how to support text-based programming environment, how to efficiently manage process data, and how to support error debugging and monitoring in the context of scientific workflow management system. And in pursuits of these questions, we have, like I, along with my collaborators and research team, conducted different projects and uh, developed two research prototypes. One is P2RC Collaborative, where multidisciplinary researchers can log in, can get access to different tools. They can drag and drop tools, and they can see the visual representation of the tools. They can configure the tools together, and they can execute the tools, and they can collaboratively analyze the tools. And they can get to access with different data set. They can chat. And all those things are supported in this version, but this is a this represents workflows graphically. But sometimes yeah, when it. workflow gets complex, it's difficult to handle graphic, uh, graphically. So we have we ha we also developed a scripting environment called Bsciflow, where developers can easily compose and execute workflows. No, no. And I I'm also working on GWF projects where I worked on migrating a whole region hydrological modeling tool um, to a modern platform and we're working on a new um, software architecture following the scientific workflow management system where uh, modelers should be able to share their um, uh, modeling um, outputs and their inputs and they should be able to do distributed processing. So I'm working on this uh, next gen platform as well. And I also worked with Nutrient app, which monitors nitrate and phosphate uh, uh, nutrient uh, concentration in uh, aquatic freshwater system. For this uh, app, I developed API, and I developed a best uh, nutrient app, um, which is uh, actually hosted in this GWF uh, site. And what tools and methods am I using? I'm actually blending uh, software engineering methodologies and ACI techniques in my research, different machine learning algorithms, CCW technologies uh, for high performance. I'm trying to using Spark and Hadoop and different programming language and different or best frameworks. What am I doing now? I'm actually continuously improving the software platforms that I'm developing to make it more usable for the scientists, uh, which include um, adaptive uh, user interface, uh, supporting asynchronous and synchronous interaction among graphically scattered scientists, and supporting on-demand human-centric provenance queries in workflows. And I am actually ap actively working on applying the research in the context of GWF and P2RC projects. And I would like to see that food and water scientists should be able to handle scientific experiments for large analysis, uh, for large data analysis collaboratively, easily, and reliably with provenance support. 
and I'm looking for users uh, for my platforms. Actually, I'm looking for the users who are struggling to work with software tools to, to conduct their um, analysis. And one big question for the group is how to efficiently, effectively collaborate and um, analyze large scale scientific data. So this is my one big question for the group. Thank you all for giving me the uh, opportunity and sorry for the rush because I know that time constraint. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Banani, that's great. So if you stop sharing your screen, then okay. we'll, we'll sure. flip over. Excellent. Javier Mora Marcias is next. Yes, Javier, I'm here. you're all set. Great. You're just Jam right now, Jam 101, so I couldn't tell. Yeah, that's <laughs> me. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. So if you put it ah. into PowerPoint mode to play, it'll be a little bigger. That's good. There you go. Perfect. Way you go. Anytime. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here uh, to, to uh, have the opportunity to share with you the general idea of my my research project. Uh, I am applying biotechnologies, currently working as a postdoc with Dr. Leon Koshan at Gibbs. I did my PhD in Mexico, working with uh, the plant model, Arabidopsis, to identify molecular mechanisms that control the root system architecture of plant under phosphate efficiency. Uh, uh, my current research um, is focused on using Arabidopsis to unravel molecular mechanisms that improve nutrient acquisition of crops under drought and flooding conditions. Uh, here, uh, uh, it, you, you can see the phenotypes that with what I was uh, working in Mexico using Arabidopsis. For example, here you can see uh, what happened with uh, uh, Arabidopsis under food nutrition and what happened where the seedlings face low phosphate uh, availability in the media. So this phenotype uh, allows uh, us to, to understand that this phenotype allows plants to, to adapt to the low phosphate condition in the soil. Uh, and we could think that this kind of phenotypes for crops could be better to take more uh, phosphate and, and nutrient from the media. And this is related uh, because the higher, highest concentration of phosphorus in the media and the soil is in the, in the top layers. So, but the problem right now is that climate change uh, is threatening um, crops grow in, in, in the field. For example, we could design root system to grow in, in, in the surface, but now we cannot predict how much water will be in the field. So this is a big problem. We don't know what is the best root system architecture for crops right now in the field. So uh, I am using, uh, what, what I am uh, doing, what I am using in the laboratory, try to, to, to control the root system architecture in order to, to design better root system architecture that we can uh, manipulate to, to uh, improve a nutrient acquisition under different uh, water availability condition. So uh, I'm using Arabidopsis, particularly using the gravitropism response, the gravity perception of Arabidopsis mutant in natural accession with weak and enhanced root gravitropism, just to, to control the, the root shape uh, of crops, in this case, Arabidopsis. So here you can see what happened uh, with, with plants that has a weak uh, root gravitropism. Uh, root gravitropism allow plants to follow the gravity. So when we enhance the root gravitropism, you can see deeper roots. So manipulating root gravitropism could be a, a, a really, really a good uh, a molecular tool to, to design root system architecture that allow us to, to design better crops to take uh, nutrients under different water availability in the media. So what, what, I, what I, uh, I done, I generate a mapping population of Arabidopsis taliana 
So I, I mutagenicized this Arabidopsis line in order to identify a mutant would enhance a root gravitropism. And you can see, for example, that the three different lines would enhance a root gravitropism of lateral roots. So what, what this idea, so now, now the, the next step is to identify those genes that were, that were uh, mutagenicided. So in order to use them to understand how the plants use the root gravitropism to not only use prediction to understand, to, to have an idea how to, to control the root uh, gravitropism of plants, uh, but identify genes that we can control, that we can use it to change the, the, the root shape of crops. So uh, I decided to, to talk in this uh, uh, um, workshop just to find if we can uh, collaborate. So now we have the possibility to modify the root shape of plants, but I don't know what is the best architecture that we could use for crops uh, to, in order to the crops take more nutrients and water from the media. And the question that I have uh, for you is, what is the best root system architecture for uh, the current Canadian crops? And that's it all. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Javier. That's wonderful. Very interesting. Okay. Moving along, we're going to zip over to our next pre uh, presenter. Susanna Barnes is going to take the. Uh, uh, yeah, can you see my screen? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Just put it into PowerPoint mode and we can hear you well. Okay, so thanks to uh, the organizers for this opportunity to connect with researchers here at the University of Saskatchewan doing work on food and water. So who am I? Uh, well, I'm a socio-cultural anthropologist. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Archaeology and Anthropology. I'm relatively new here at USAS, just going into my second year of teaching. I, like Carol, engage in community-based uh, research, but ethnographically re grounded research with an interest in customary land and uh, natural resource management systems and intergenerational health and well-being, as well as international development. My main field site is in Timor-Leste, for those of you are familiar with Timor-Leste, it's in Southeast Asia. I use engaged anthropological methods, working with communities to undertake ethnographically grounded research. Now, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with these methods, they include qualitative uh, methods and tools such as participant observation, interviews, community meetings, stakeholder forums, um, surveys, uh, including market food service surveys, and um, things like food and water mapping, uh, in the context of wild food research I'm doing at the moment, I go on things such as wild food and medicinal plant walks with uh, local community members and document what we find on the way. So what have I done? Um, I've, as I said before, I've done most of my field work in Timor-Leste, where I've been involved in research on customary land tenure. And just to clarify, when I talk about customary here, what I what I refer to is the multiplicity of indigenous East Timorese uh, practices. So I was, I've been involved in 18 months field work embedded in three different linguistic communities in Timor, documenting local land and natural resource management systems, and really investigating the centrality of communal ritual to these systems and how these systems have been uh, revitalized since independence was achieved finally in 2002. Another project that I've been working on is on customary approaches to health and healing. And this has been uh, working with a range of customary healers and members of the community. And this is what has really drawn me um, to consider more directly the notion of the sociality of water and its significance for what we call uh, local spirit ecologies and notions of intergenerational well-being. 
um, with colleagues in Australia. We're just in the final um, sound fixing stages of a uh, uh, film that we've produced documenting this variety of healing practices in Timor-Leste. So I hope that comes out soon. And I hope it'll be of interest to you. Uh, and there's a quote here on the slide from one of the healers that we work with about the importance of water to um, healing. What am I, oh, how can I move on? Here we go. What am I doing now? Um, at present, I'm working on two major projects. Uh, the first concerns the enduring effects of colonialism um, on land practices. So the way that they continue to shape land classification, policies, administration, and legislation, how this affects the way that people gain access to land and natural resources, and the impact that this has not only on livelihoods, but also social and cultural relations. And this is a collaborative project that brings together scholars from across the community of Portuguese uh, language countries known as the CPLP. The second project is being undertaken in partnership with a local East Timorese NGO who approached a colleague at Bishop's University and I to assist um, the community that they're working in, in documenting and preserving <clears throat> their history of wild crops and local uh, coping strategies in times of food uh, scarcity. Now this NGO has been at the, really at the forefront of engaging with customary land management practices, some of those revitalized practices that I spoke about earlier, and also creating seed banks of local seed varieties. So there's been a push to create seed banks uh, since independence, but little thought has been put into the, the idea of local uh, seed varieties. So together working with this partner and the communities, we hope to contribute to strengthening local food sovereignty through uh, knowledge sharing. Um, what, I, what I would like to see in food water, well, I'm actually very excited to hear the work being done uh, by some researchers in this group this morning. There were a couple of, of researchers talking about their community engagement and, and also in this session. Um, the work being done by researchers to, to bridge the gap between natural and social sciences. Um, my feeling is that all too often the complex social and cultural dynamics that underpin access to food and water are overlooked. Uh, so for example, in places like Timor-Leste, Failures of water resource management, in particular of water and sanitation projects, are often attributed to um, local failures. So the lack of skilled local or state actors, inadequate budget allocation, the lack of local political will, uh, will to prioritize water management. Little, if any, attention is paid during this project cycle, during planning and then execution and evaluation to local hydrosocial relations which I think are key to um, sustainable water governance. Similarly, in relation to food and agriculture, development actors tend to focus on technical and market-based solutions that seldom take into consideration the social and cultural meanings of food and food production. Um, so I'm interested in working with researchers and practitioners working on food and water to engage with these social cultural contexts that give these resources water and food meaning and the localized socio-political processes that determine flows and access. And um, I don't think this is necessarily limited to the international development context. I think that this is uh, equally applicable here in Canada in many different uh, settings. Um, just also on that, I want to, I want to add that um, two summers ago, we established a uh, Memorandum of Understanding with the University of the National University of Timor Leste, which is in in a lot of need for support. So, if anyone is interested in that, especially with those working in agriculture, I'd, I'd be happy to have a conversation about that. So, my big question to the group is actually a three-part question, and it's it's more of a, a, a sort of self-reflection, I guess. So, in engaging with food and water, do we seek to understand? the role uh, that these resources play in sustaining forms of sociocultural life, including human to human, interspecies and more than human relations. Do we understand the varied social cultural context of valuing, managing and using these resources? And finally, do we understand the importance of these relations for the long-term sustainability 
of outcomes. That's my presentation. I hope I stayed within the time limit. Thank you. Close. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Susanna. That's super. Um, I know how hard this is, and I have to do this in a minute. So, um, all right. Thank you very much. So we're moving right along. Warren Helgeson's the next speaker. Yes. Hi, Warren. Hello. We can see you and hear you. So whenever okay. you're ready, you can pull up your slides on your share screen. Okay. Do you see my... Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Okay, there we go. There, it's coming now. Yep. Looks good. Oh, okay. Right. Hey. Yep, all good. You're on the first one now. Right on. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Christy, and, and thank you, Jay, for organizing this. Um, so yeah, my name is Warren Helgeson, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Civil, Geological, and Environmental Engineering. Um, if we can get a slide, there we go. Yeah, so I am uh, formally trained as an agricultural engineer. Um, so I work in the area of agro-environmental engineering. I teach primarily in the program of environmental engineering. Uh, focusing on agricultural hydrology, and I also spent a brief stint um, as, a, as a research or an irrigation engineer uh, with the Alberta government before returning back to the university to do my PhD. But my research addresses, I'll describe in the next few slides, are really focused on, on land atmosphere interactions. Um, so talking about how, how weather influences um, hydrology and, uh, and, and how that interplays with land use changes, etc. Um, just a quick plug for my work with the International Commission, Commission on Irrigation and Drainage. Um, so I'm currently the president of the Canadian National Committee on Irrigation and Drainage, which is an affiliate of, of the Canadian Water Resources Association. So it's a network of, uh, of water professionals that are interested and, and work in, in irrigation and drainage. So tools and methods that, that I use, um, I guess I, I, I like to play with toys. That's what a lot of my colleagues refer to these as. Uh, um, but we, we make uh, our group makes makes measurements of of the near surface, uh, um, I guess, atmosphere through to the soil uh, root zone continuum. Um, so we use things like eddy covariance. Uh, we use detailed pro, uh, point scale measurements of soil moisture, temperature, those sorts of things. We also have towers to profile the, the near surface boundary layer, um, different sort of remote sensing boundary layer techniques, such as scintillometers and SODARs. Um, in order to extend uh, that space um, in, or that, that sphere of influence or sphere of uh, observation, I guess, in time or space, we also use land surface models. And more increasingly, I'm, I'm working with uh, remote sensing tools uh, through some collaborators as well. Um, some of the, the past work that I've been involved in, um, a few examples, so doing a, a feasibility of solar irrigation uh, project. So there's this little picture here, you see a little little test scale uh, a center pivot irrigation system that, that's um, with the energy for pumping and moving the, the irrigation system is provided exclusively from solar solar energy. Uh, I've also so looked, at, looked at the effects of irrigation on soil greenhouse gas processes and collaboration with with Rich Farrell and others, and uh, also looking at, at different soil moisture scaling um, relationships on, so how do we, how do we take our, our point scale measurements and scale those up to field scale or to the decision, to the uh, guess relevant decision-making scales. Uh, the kind of work that I'm currently engaged in um, is, is really about uh, looking at different, how energy and water balances um, change at different scales. So uh, I guess one of the most practical um, questions is, is how does evaporation, um, or how do we quantify evaporation from our heterogeneous prairie landscapes? So of course in the, in the prairie we have wetlands and, and different agricultural surfaces um, you know, right next to each other. And so uh, when we wanna scale that up to something that's, that's useful, uh, we need to think about how all of those different surfaces interact. And so that really, I guess uh, motivates a lot of my research. I also look at, at crop climate hydrology interactions. Um, so looking at, at how uh, land use and cropping changes influence 
uh, climate and hydrology. Um, this little graph here just shows the the latent heat flux or the energy used in evaporating of of, of some typical uh, agricultural crops that we might find in in this region over over three day period. And you can see that that there's massive differences in in the amount of uh, evaporation that that can occur from from these different surfaces, right? And this is important because the cropping choices that that farmers make um, do have an impact or a feedback effect on our, our local climate. And I'm also working with um, precision irrigation or variable rate precision irrigation uh, technology as well. Uh, the things that I would like to see is a better integration of disciplines in developing crop water modeling frameworks. So um, at this university, we have uh, a lot of very specialized um, areas where there's a lot of deep knowledge, um, but we don't seem to do a really good job of, of working across those, those things when, when it comes to um, some of our modeling activities. And I think this, this meeting is a big step forward. I'd also like to, to better quantify the potential role of large scale irrigation in the province and, and talk about some of the potential impacts and develop a better understanding of how future crops will act as moderators of climate and hydrology. And that's my big question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's a good last question. Thanks, Warren. Where are the donuts? Where's the free lunch? Jay's getting off easy by not providing a free lunch for this. I'm trying to figure out how we could do virtual donuts. <laughs> virtual donuts. Thanks a lot, Warren, that was excellent. Um, okay, so I guess I'm up next, Palash, so uh, I think I can share, yep, and hopefully I will keep to time and yell at myself. Okay, so I'll get started. Uh, who am I? I'm an ecotoxicologist and I have a faculty appointment in seems like everywhere. Biology is my primary appointment. I'm also in the School of Environment and Sustainability and uh, associate in toxicology, and I've been at the U of S since 2010. Um, my research really is focused on understanding exposure and effects of environmental pollutants. Um, I have a sort of special interest in, in agricultural pesticides, um, but I do work on diverse uh, chemicals and chemical classes. Um, and really I'm looking at their effects on birds, insects, and aquatic ecosystems. And here in the prairies, um, my area of focus, of course, is the wetlands. But um, all my former work as a PhD student and postdoc were all on rivers and streams, uh, both in Canada and in the UK. So uh, I worked on water for a long time. And uh, much of my research really is quite applied and, and has an emphasis on, on conservation. So what have I done? And I'm kind of mixing this with some of the tools uh, that I use. Essentially, if we look at the prairie region, I have kind of a, a geographic focus here. 82% um, of the farmland is uh, in Canada is right here in the prairies. So if we're going to make an impact on agriculture, it's really, I think it's got to be done here. Um, and this is also a hot spot for wetlands and biodiversity. Um, the prairies also use the majority of Canada's pesticides. So more than 80% of uh, the country's pesticides are applied right here. Um, we know that some of the chemicals are really problematic, like the neonicotinoids have gotten quite a bit of press, um, and we've been studying them since 2012. And here you can see a map that we've produced that shows that over 215,000 kilos are applied annually to the prairies in uh, essentially the, um, in the same areas where wetlands are. And in fact, this has led to repeated and chronic water contamination of prairie surface waters or prairie wetlands. So we've been measuring these wetlands um, across the region, um, obviously an emphasis in Saskatchewan, but here also we've been modeling the, <clears throat> the risk areas, the high risk areas shown in red of where in uh, the prairies there is the greatest risk for pesticide contamination. Um, not only from neonicotinoids, but any uh, agrochemicals. And we've also been studying the effects on aquatic insects from notably the neonicotinoids. 
And we found that there are negative impacts on emergence, uh, their abundance, biomass, timing, and sex ratios through a range of different practices or, or techniques, both in the lab and in the field and using some of these semi-field conditions and um, using uh, things like these limno corrals, which are placed over wetlands. And then also we've done, we do quite a bit of work on birds, uh, different bird species, usually farmland type birds. So here pictured are uh, a white crowned sparrow, which is a common seed eating bird, but also on swallows like the tree swallow. We often tag the birds and put trackers on them. And we look at physiology, uh, survival, chick quality, body mass and their migration. And we know that these chemicals can have negative impacts on all of those aspects. So what am I doing now relative to this question? I have one study going on right now on uh, looking at the impact of perennial vegetation buffers around wetlands and how those might mitigate pesticide and nutrient contamination. And this is in partnership with Alice Canada and Ducks Unlimited. Um, and so we're finding some exciting results there. And then we also are doing research um, on working farms again, uh, where we have producers who we're working directly with to plan and implement perennial plantations in strategic areas. So in the left around wetlands and on the right are fields where we've uh, planted them in saline or marginal areas. And we're studying the impacts on water quality as well as impacts on soil health, um, as well as biodiversity, avian and insect biodiversity, um, profitability and yields uh, to see whether or not these replacing these areas um, has an impact on farmers bottom line, but also on the ecosystem services that they can potentially provide. So what would I like to do or see in the food water kind of realm or nexus? Well, um, essentially I have kind of been working on this for a few years now, trying to build this Canadian Prairie Agroecosystem Resilience Network that was started in 2017 or CPARnet. So some of the people who are on this meeting are, I'm very familiar with their work and we've been trying to launch this for a few years. We did apply for NSERC funding and we all, went all the way to the last stage and were not successful. But the goal really of that kind of network um, and its existence as a network is still uh, alive and well. And the idea is to create a network of uh, study farms across the Canadian prairies um, where we work as a collaborative group, interdisciplinary group that's really studying the whole system um, to implement some of these experimental practices, some of the agroecology or um, regenerative agricultural practices, and then study all the impacts um, from productivity, soil health, wetland function, biodiversity, and economics. And my big question for the group to think about is how can we better incorporate participatory science into our research? Um, there's lots of work um, that's saying that really participatory science, which is where scientists work with non-scientists and often with communities or in this case farmers in real time um, to kind of have them really lead the, the uh, experiment and these these farmers are innovators or early adopters. And if we can get them to, to implement these practices, we can actually study them in real time. And um, you know, this is, has a dual impact. You can actually improve adoption um, because they are the disseminators. Their neighbors are looking at what they're doing. They essentially are demonstrating and doing uh, the science at the same time. So it has a lot of power. So I'd like to see that happen more. And I think this group could help that. All right, so I'm gonna quit there. Okay, so thank you for listening. And Steve is up next. Steve Shirtliff is going to present next. And I think you should- well, Unmute Steve. and find, I've got about 75 screens open here to find the right one to share. Microsoft PowerPoint. Okay, that should be it, right? Yeah, it's coming Looking up good? now. Yeah, perfect. Just okay, uh, great. I'm Steve Shirtliff. Thank you very much, Christy. I'm from the Department of Plant Sciences in the College of Agricultural uh, and Bioresources. And uh, oh, my, my, oh, there we go. Who am I? I'm an easily distracted agronomist. Uh, I 
an agronomist means, means somebody that that their research is uh, is in the area of managing crops. But uh, over the years, I've been distracted and. Uh, and I was trained in mostly Manitoba. And I, I, I wanted to share something that my PhD supervisor in Manitoba, Martin Enns, uh, told me when I uh, got a job out here in Saskatchewan. And Martin had, he, he had done a PhD with, uh, with Brian Fowler in the area of winter wheat. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of the no-till system was designed to deal with winter wheat, kind of an untold story there, uh, the, the stubbled in system. But anyways, I remember Martin saying to me, okay, Steve, there are three things that matter to agriculture, to crop production in Saskatchewan. And it's water, water, and water. And that's always stuck with me, this idea. And, and coming here in the early 2000s with that, those of you that are old enough to remember that devastating multi-year drought that happened when, we you know, probably produce more grasshopper biomass than almost anything else on the prairies. It was indeed very thing, a uh, very profound. Uh, what tools, methods am I using? Well, I use mostly small plot agronomy, which means I grow crops in small plots, like you see when you drive around uh, campus and we test different agronomic methodologies, trying to optimize it for production and for efficiency. We're recently working up into the field scale agronomic trial areas. I have kind of, you know, a share with kind of a, a vision like Christie has a little bit with, but with, you know, from our more production oriented point of view where we could somehow democratize, uh, democratize agronomic trials so that, so that we could have them, uh, have them um, more accessible and so they cost less and are easier to do and so we can be more efficient and more productive. Of course in the last five years or so uh, I've kind of become the Im imaging guy a little bit, the drone guy on campus. We've been doing a lot of UAV imaging uh, uh, for, as part of crop phenotyping and recently we've started to use the, what we've learned in this area up into the area utilizing some of these techniques we've learned when we're phenotyping crops from the UAV close in uh, uh, remote sensing way to satellite imaging and remote sensing. We're working in that area now. Oop, I just went the wrong way. Uh, what have I done? So agronomy within that, I've worked, looked at pulses mostly, a lot of lentil work, oats, uh, canola, and I've done a fair bit of work in organic crops where we've developed um, some quite, um, I could say resilient uh, weed control methods that have allowed uh, organic farmers in Saskatchewan to successfully grow crops like lentils to the to the to the volume that they've now oversaturated the market and the price has gone down a lot unfortunately but <laughs> but that's the way things happen in weed science I my PhD in I, mostly the work has been in non herbicidal weed control looking at methods to control weeds without herbicides I've done some work in volunteer canola but I also started out in spatial weed dynamics because I've always had this innate interest in kind of anything to do with spatial processes that happen at the landscape level. You know, I've, I've been always a map geek, geek, love atlases, love, you know, love any, pouring through atlases and, uh, and, and, uh, and imagery on a planetary scale. And so that, that uh, is one theme that's continued through my career. What am I doing now? I, so uh, right, right now what we're doing, we're still doing the agronomy. I mentioned the phenotyping, we have the crop imaging laboratory, and we're starting to use some of that satellite and other interest of to start to try to understand precision agriculture, not necessarily advocating for it or, or promoting it, but to try to understand the underpinnings of it. There's been a lot of good work done. I hope Jeff shares some of the good work, but especially others, uh, others in soil science of, uh, you know, Dan Pennock laid a, a strong groundwork for this years ago at the University of Saskatchewan, so we're hoping to do it. So what would I like to under, uh, uh, do and see in food water? Well, to better understand water use efficiency in crops and how to, and how to manage spatial and temporal variability in crop yield. And you know, here's you know, a typical prairie uh, scene and you know, what you see, you know, we've seen this in several other uh, presentations and you know, we're seeing a lot of surface water in there. A lot, in, in many cases, a lot of those uh, potholes may be ephemeral and dry up in some years and be the highest yielding areas, but in other years they drown out and don't yield anything. Is there a way that we can better manage these areas? You know, Christy talked about, about the areas that aren't productive, like the saline areas, putting them into, uh, into a crop with some beneficial ecological services. Yeah, that makes sense. But what about for the areas that are sometimes good and not sometimes good? Is there ways that we can predict and manage those better that? 
And maybe this is where we get to my big question. Can we forecast water availability for crops before planting? This is something that was started a long time ago. Uh, Les Henry was a big proponent of this in soil sciences years ago, looking at soil water availability to get an idea of how to how to predict the temporal, the temporal uh, differences in crop production in the year so we can manage our input levels to deal with that and our expectations. You know, precipitation, the, uh, you know, can we, is there, is there a way that we can model this better? I'm not asking to predict how much it's gonna rain two months out, but just how to do that. And can we integrate uh, all this with data that is available to manage crops more efficiently? There's so, so, so much data that's out there right now. And I look at, you know, when we look at the remote sensing data, when we look at, you know, when you start to get, look at what data sets are available on the Google Earth engine, and how can we, how can we use this uh, to essentially manage crops more agronomically, environmentally, and financially efficiency. These are not, these do not have to be exclusive goals. We can find a middle ground where we can optimize all of those. That's it for me. Hopefully I stayed under five. Great, thanks so much, Steve. Oh, awesome. I didn't, shoot. Well, it's okay. I think there's a theme for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard to only ask professors to talk for five minutes. Okay, I think our last speaker is, uh, so on the program it says John Pomeroy, but J um, we have a, a change in the program. So uh, Jeff, you're gonna be speaking next, I think, is that right? Yep, that's great. I just need to have someone give me the rights to share my screen. So um, if you can, Steve, if you, if you, yeah, Steve, I think you have to kind of stop sharing. Okay. Oh, so shoot. go to the top. And the little green thing will come down, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So okay. if you stop sharing, then we can switch it over. Sorry about that. Okay. And so Jeff McDonald will be our last speaker. Just coming up, Jeff. Okay. Here it is. Oh. You're good to go. Thanks. There we go. Can you see me okay? Uh, I can't, I've lost where you are, but yeah, there I can see you now. Yep, perfect. Okay. Well, it's great to be here. My name is Jeff McDonald. Uh, I'm a professor in SENS and associate director of the Global Institute for Water uh, Security. And I've been here about eight years. I came from Oregon State University where I taught for many years prior to, prior to my return to Canada. Uh, I'm a hydrologist mostly interested in uh, non-frozen forms of precipitation, but increasingly frozen ground and snow are making their way into my research. Uh, most of my work is at the hill slope scale and it's, it's very much field-based. And these are my three main research questions. What's the source flow path and, and travel time of runoff from when precipitation strikes the hill slope to when it gets into a, a stream channel? Uh, again, I'm field-based and field work's getting tougher and tougher each year. A lot of my work involves isotope tracing, so I was happy to hear others talk about their work with stable isotopes, but also blending in elements of soil physics and more recently plant hydraulics, uh, getting at questions I'll, I'll refer to a bit later. Um, field work again is getting tougher. This is a photo my wife took. I was taking some samples about a year ago. Uh, those doing field work can appreciate this, this pain. Maybe just one thing, GPR, uh, gr we've used geophysics like ground penetrating radar, but a lot of work I do is uh, ground penetrating rebar and uh, trying to get the contact between soil and bedrock or soil and a subsoil layer. So what I have mostly done is hill slope scale hydrology. Where does water go when it rains? What flow path does it take? How long does it take to follow those blue arrows to appear at a, say a trench at the base of a slope. This is kind of like Frankenstein hydrology because we take a, 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 a digger and rip a great trench to try to measure unadulterated the flow from the slope. So a lot of my work's been at LTER sites, these things we were talking about before the lunch break and uh, at, at several sites, particularly in the Pacific Rim and increasingly in, in China. Since returning to Canada, coming to the U of S, 
uh, this site at Swift Current has been very appealing. I've had a couple of folks work here. These are three, five hectare uh, runoff plots that have been monitored for about 50 years now. And this has been a, a terrific playground for understanding hill slope scale runoff in this environment. And I would make a pitch for this going back to Christie's point about, you know, if we had a, a range of sites uh, to work in, this, this would really be a, a, a key target. Uh, what am I doing? In the last 10 years, I got interested in where the water goes uh, the other direction. Of course, the water balance evapotranspiration is key. And this is a very surprising finding where we traced isotopically water trees were using and found that they were using water that doesn't make its way to groundwater recharge or runoff. This idea of eco-hydrological separation or what uh, we've called the two water worlds hypothesis. We posed it as a null hypothesis to then test globally. And to our surprise, um, we found that it's quite widespread, this, this separation between plant transpiration and groundwater recharge and stream flow. So this is something I'm, I'm still quite interested in. And with Dave and others, uh, we've been looking at this uh, in wheat in Saskatchewan. This is a, a paper we published together a couple of years ago. And with Bing C in China, we're looking at this in apple tree production and finding some rather surprising things like 30 year old water making up the water in the apple in terms of extractions from the deep Luss Plateau. Uh, in terms of what I'd like to see and do, I, I run this most facility you might've seen on Preston Avenue. It's basically a, a, a 3,600 square foot high bay lab for doing hill slope works. We can freeze hill slopes, we, have, we can do rain experiments. And I think getting at these mechanistic links between climate, soil and vegetation uh, could be fun to do with many of you at this most facility. Again, we can put hill slopes and trailers on load cells and really make measurements uh, that get at some of the, the mechanisms we might be interested in. Uh, Andrew Ierson's a collaborator on this work as, as are some others on the call. And then lastly, I guess my big question is, can we develop an age-based water balance? We all know the water balance, the uh, hydrology's most basic equation. So porosity times depth times change in storage with time is input minus uh, evapotranspiration and leakage. All of this is dependent on the soil moisture state. And I really like Bobby's slide this morning because she's talking about memory what about when we're irrigating with groundwater and that groundwater is fossil water, 10,000 years old. It's mixing with uh, a, a rainfall that might've occurred a few weeks ago. I think until we can get to grips with the other half of this water balance, that is the, the, the blend of ages that make up this water balance, we're gonna have a hard time understanding water sustainability on the prairie and elsewhere. And this is some new work that's trying to get at uh, the range of ages that we might see, uh, not only in the, the root zone, but uh, below that when we look at the whole kind of water balance at the, the hill slope scale. And Christy, I'll leave it there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jeff. That's great. And thanks to all of the speakers for uh, zipping along, telling us everything you have ever done in five minutes. Um, which is a huge challenge. So what I think we'll do first is maybe just kind of have the floor open for any general questions. Anyone that had questions about any of the speakers for this session, like anything they wanted to ask. all amazingly clear. That's fantastic. Um, all right, so then we'll kind of move on, I guess, and uh, let's, let's get the conversation going about perhaps how, do, how does the group see, um, you know, the greatest opportunities for uh, collaboration or working together? Um, is there a particular um, aspect that we should focus on or topics or is there ideas around uh, sort of 
ways that we can um, collectively get, you know, use each other's uh, expertise. What are people's ideas for collaboration, improving collaboration? I guess cross-disciplinary collaboration. I, I might just uh, make a, a brief comment to kick things off that one of the things I've really appreciated with Karen Chad, our VP research that's coming here is uh, her notion of being shovel ready for opportunities. And we've had some big opportunities we've been successful with as a university. And I see one element of this, and I'm, I'm sure Jay and Leon are thinking this, is us being shovel ready for the next big, you know, whatever it might be, CFRF opportunity or what have you. And uh, some of the things that will come from this probably we won't even know about for weeks, months, even years ahead. But I've been so struck by the fact that this is a, almost a whole different constellation of people compared to conversations we had like this eight years ago. So I've been really uh, appreciating the young faculty that have been hired, especially in recent years. And uh, what a different mix it is, Jay, to uh, you know Howard's era with the Institute just eight, eight years ago. Well, I'm so glad that you think I'm young, Jeff. <laughs> I didn't say that. I, I would like to say it's great for some of us older guys to, uh, and guys I use as a as a as a gender free uh, word uh, designation to be able to meet, uh, regardless of age, people that are doing research that is applicable across. And I think you know, coming, you know, we've I've been in, in the perk a lot, and the one thing that uh, you know, the first half of the per kind of selected for people that work well together. And I think if we can, as a sooner we can sort out people that can work well together and group that, you know, cause you have to, you have to kind of leave your, sometimes you're, you have to, you have to be open to share. And sometimes that can be very hard for academics. We're so used to, so used to keeping data and everything so close that sharing it is a big thing. And, uh, and uh, but I see a lot of potential for for like-minded research in this area of uh, water water on the prairies. Of course, I'm looking at it from the crop point of view, but there's of course a lot others. You know, I was I've been thinking about it. Jeff had mentioned um, the uh, you know with the CF refs and uh, you know we have the two big CF refs. We've got the perk. You know, we're just going to digital phenotyping by genotyping for improving you know digital breeding of crops and one on water. And I know there'll be one coming up in a few years when I think the perk is finishing or finished. And I'm wondering if this might be one area where we might think about integrating the two themes. I know that probably the, the global water futures will be continuing, but this would be more integrating, you know, the, the water and hydrology in with crop and crop, you know, tying the two together. Can we tailor crops for certain hydrologic or, or nutrient hydrologic uh, environments? And vice versa, can there be water management tailored for certain crops? So I don't know, just something off the top of my head. But uh, uh, you know, it, it, obviously we want to see something long term coming out of this, these, this meeting, and then subsequent meetings that uh, you know is, is sustainable. Yeah. So that's good. Good question, Leon. And and so <clears throat> I just want to make the point that um, there are going to be a big picture things that that we could be thinking about as outcomes, but also even you know, a couple of uh, individual researchers getting together who, you know, meet because of this meeting, uh, to me is a, to me is a big success. Yeah, the shovel ready, a uh, big picture stuff is really important. And um, yeah, I think uh, ultimately our best bet, uh, you know, I don't think lightning strikes twice, you know, twice, meaning like, you know, it struck twice for the two CF refs. Um, and uh, I don't think it's going to happen again. Um, so I think that we should be thinking about, you know, some kind of joint project. It could be food, water, it could be something else. But I think being shovel ready, you know, thinking about big things that we can undertake um, should be some, you know, th uh, a thread that we keep, a thread that we keep, uh, uh, keep thinking about. I think that's going to be really, really important. Um, yeah, we'll just I'll chime just chime in. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jay. Finish no, your thought. I, you know, other people should talk. Well, I just, I mean, one of the things that's kind of always, you know, I don't know if it's bugged me, but it's, it's just that I think like when I look at the two global institutes, you know, 
it just seems so bizarre that they don't overlap or interact more. And, um, you know, for example, I, I see relatively, you know, right from the inception of Global Institute of Food Security, I saw very little sort of environmental elements in, in the kind of, I don't know if it was the hiring or the, the themes that were put forward. Um, and so, you know, I think one of the, the strengths that this could bring is, is getting closer to that nexus, right, of where there is either environmental or social, social uh, benefits and, uh, of both food and, and water. I mean, those are essentials and necessities, but they're, they're sort of operating so separately right now that I think that this is a really important step to try and, you know, bring those uh, elements together and not necessarily does each institute need to hire you know separate people I think this is the I mean look how many people are I didn't even know we had this much expertise to be fair uh, you know you kind of think you know who's on campus and who's doing what and I feel like this is just revealed that we actually have no clue who's yeah who's doing this work so you know that's fantastic and so I think that's where we need much more um, cooperation and coordination. Yeah, so that sort of gets to my point, Christy. So yeah, I mean, I agree 100%, of course, and that's why we've been pursuing this stuff. And this is certainly not the first thing that we've pursued. Uh, so uh, uh, we wrote the CFI together. Uh, um, GIFS is leading the Bangladesh stuff. We'll hear more about it tomorrow. So there's, uh, so those are a couple of things, but we want to create, I mean, there are a lot of people here, and you're right, I do not know most of the, I probably don't know 80% of the people that have uh, participated in that workshop. And I think that's, I think it's a very uh, a rich opportunity for us. Um, so again, we're not gonna solve it all in this workshop. Um, and as you mentioned this morning, Christy, like distilling this down and sort of, you know, summarizing it and you're know, writing up, there's so much that's been presented and we're not even halfway through. It's going to be a real challenge, which is why we asked for the, some of those uh, synthesis thoughts, right? So what you just said, I mean, we'll capture it, but if you could write it down and put it in an email, it's really important. So really, no question that the institutes in, in AgBio uh, need to be, you know, water, food, the institutes need to be working more together. And it's, uh, you know, one of my core hopes for, uh, as uh, at least on my side, as a JWS uh, uh, director. Yeah, and, and Christy, I, I totally agree with you about agriculture and en environmental aspects of, you know, the, the whole environmental and carbon footprint of agriculture, you know, writ large. I, I would say, uh, I think GIFS gets it now, because I mean, our two major funders, both Nutrient and the province have been saying to us in the last year that, that they're looking at agriculture and they need, we need to be more sustainable um, and by sustainable, they're talking about environmental sustainability and reducing carbon mm -hmm. footprint along with increasing yields, et cetera. Um, and there's the whole side of the re re not just reducing fertilizer inputs that have in negative environmental implications, but all the other chemicals. So, yeah, it's it's an area that, uh, you know, we 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 put together an unsuccessful NFRC exploration NOI on kind of using AI and agriculture in terms of Proving carbon sequestration um, through the through the in, in the soil, and uh, uh, you know that's just one component of this environmental side of things. So, so yeah, you know, right, to hear. right there, uh, you're right there, Leon. That's another great example of something that we could be together because that that zone, like the carbon sequestration thing, that's a water and a plant thing that has to be Absolutely. done, has to be addressed together. You know, I just wanted to make the point. You, you may be a, so one reason, Christie's, you know. Uh, um, GIFS is a, you know, it's, it's public private, right? And they've had a very much an industry focus. Uh, so they're a little bit, they're a little bit different uh, than, than what we do uh, at the Institute. That said, I think that there's going to be huge pressure on companies like Nutrien. Uh, uh, you know, the, the social expectations are going to be for much greater environmental stewardship and for addressing climate change and for doing whatever they can to sequester carbon. And a lot of that's gonna come through the financial side. It's gonna come through the financial backers. And so they're gonna to be told that they're not gonna to get any loans. 
um, and that's going to be the that's going to be the lever. So that's another opportunity for us, and we're already doing that on the water quality side here at the institute. Um, yeah. But that's something for us to keep our eyes on. That's going to be a big lever. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's uh, there's great potential there. I mean, just. Yeah, carbon is one aspect, um, but enhancing sustainability through input reduction uh, is another is another big one. And you're right, corporations already like, you know, A and W and and uh, General Mills and others are all like they're demanding that from their growers. Um, so it's feeding all the way down to the to the producers. Um, right and, right and into our whole, cereal bowls. You're right into your cereal bowls. So uh, yeah, so I think. You know what are we doing as uh, whether we're scientists or, or social scientists? Um, you know to actually make the case that you know we have actual evidence that something is better or worse, right? I mean that's really what farmers are asking or the companies are asking for. They want some you know evidence base that it's that some practices are good or better, right, um, than others. And how much better are they or worse, right? So that there can be, and you can quantify that in multiple ways. And often that ends up being economically, uh, you know, through, through various incentive programs and, and um, carbon pricing and other things that um, will feed into, feed into those. But I think there's just a huge gap in our ability to take what production practices are being done on the ground to, and what we're measuring and translating that into something that is meaningful that will shift agriculture um, not only here in Canada but and in the prairie region but you know around the world and so hey, that's where we need question. to think that's big that's where the policy on... part comes oh, in right yeah so absolutely you know... A question here. Uh, I kind of feel like uh, we're in the, um, you know, using a uh, comparison to the United States, the uh, the Kansas or the Nebraska of the United States, and I just wonder about um, the willingness of uh, the agricultural community here, say in Saskatchewan, to embrace principles of sustainability or is it going to have to come through right the big companies that are making the loans and thinking about the growers well i've thought a lot about that that's the carrot and the stick approach right which one is better um and i actually think you know in places like saskatchewan steve might have other opinions but i i really think the carrot is more effective here uh, and I think that only because the government here does not want to implement a stick on farmers at all. There's zero motivation for that, um, politically and otherwise. There just seems to be absolutely no appetite. However, incentives, crop insurance, uh, and other carrots like uh, carbon pricing and and you know giving something for ecosystem services and also all of that is attractive. Uh, and so that is where we're gonna get the greatest headway. But I don't know, others might have different opinions than well, I do. I actually agree with you, Christy, uh, mostly on this. Maybe. Okay, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm glad you brought up, uh, I'm glad you brought up uh, crediting of ecosystem services because I think, you know, if, uh, given that farmers are you know, are entrusted with the societal benefit of providing food to society, I think to assume that they are also going to be, have another prime motivation to be protectors, absolute protectors of the ecosystem and with no financial remediation is unrealistic. We have yeah. to have a model where if there are, if there is a, if, a, if it's an ecosystem service that farmers are rewarded for it. Yeah. That is that there has to be a character reward that, you know, if it, it, you know, but a lot of this stuff, like, you know, what you talked about with, you know, like just identifying areas of the landscape where farmers actually lose money at, and there's actually probably 10% of the acreage in Saskatchewan, maybe not that much, maybe 5% at least that they lose money at. They, they don't yeah. make money at growing that. They would be better off managed 
it would be better off just manage for ecosystem services, even if it was a zero sum game for the farmers, you know, it would actually make them money. So there are, there's a lot of places to move within this. So, you know, Steve, um, that kind of brings me back to Bruno Basso's talk. I don't, uh, uh, yeah, you went to that, right? Because we talked afterwards, I think, I think. Um, he was the guy who was mapping out basically like yield stability, thermal stability, right? All that stuff. Anyway, um, that sort of stuff is wrapped into that CFI. Whether or not we get it doesn't matter. There are approaches out there where we can start uh, you know, using our current resources, start doing and trying some of that stuff out and improving upon it. Um, so lots of lots of good work. I think we should probably wrap it up though, yeah. because uh, we've got a, we need our brains for three o'clock. We do, uh, yeah. I was gonna thanks. suggest the same yeah, thing, Jay, so, so thank you. Yeah, thanks uh, a lot. Hi, before we leave, oh. can I like uh, ask you something in terms of collaboration? Because I feel like uh, this workshop is a great opportunity to learn about uh, like research methodologies and uh, what kind of tools researchers are using uh, for uh, conducting their research in food and water security. And as I don't know how much you got understood from my talk as I was rushing so much. Uh, so my research is on helping the researchers so that uh, they can easily like model their um, scientific uh, experiment with uh, their data set. And uh, so I have been uh, like, after I joined as a research associate in the P2RC project in 2016, I'm working with uh, different uh, uh, like soil scientists, including Steve, um, uh, there are different Steve. So uh, Bobby Elgerson and another salt Steve. Yeah, Steve. Um, so um, uh, they mentioned about the, that uh, they're really struggling with their uh, analytic tools. Like it's very difficult for them to do repetitive analysis and to connect with the data sets. So I'm curious to learn from you guys like uh, whether you, 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 you are in the same situation, are you struggling with your analysis with the software, like connecting different software tools to get your um, output? Yeah. yeah, well, those are great points, uh, Bonnie. I think we'll, we'll, we definitely all could use better uh, systems management um, as you yeah. described. So, I think that'll be a, an important topic going forward, particularly as we become start using more complex interdisciplinary data, um, how to manage and actually use that effectively is gonna require expertise um, on that element. So yeah, I appreciate your comments. Yeah, but also, Jane, I, I would like to know how you guys are actually collaborating in your, uh, like if you are expert in uh, uh, soil, and another one is expert in water or an uh, environment. So how you guys are collaborating? Like, are you using uh, different sets of tools that need to be connected so that you can get a combined or collaborative, uh, uh, like, uh, like how you guys interact for your analysis? Like the, that's kind of questions uh, uh, like I, I want to, know like how you guys are doing it and I want to model in our platform like so that it's good well we we don't have a collaboration yet that's but I think that will be a good one maybe we can write that down Jay for the afternoon discussion the open discussion or bring it up again Benani for that uh, for the last uh, three o'clock open discussion okay Thank Excellent. You, well, I'm going to make sure that everybody gets a break in. So um, we'll come back in at three o'clock.